This week on Enzyme Focus, we commemorate Anzac Day, which this year marks the 97th anniversary since the ill-fated landing of Australian and New Zealand soldiers at Gallipoli. Later on in the programme, we head to Masterton's Hood Aerodrome, where Jean DeMarco from the Vintage Aviator shows me around their rare collection of historic military aircraft from World War I. But first we hear about some of the dedicated young airmen of World War II who left the relative peace and tranquility of New Zealand shores and headed off on what many thought would be the adventure of a lifetime. And for many of those young men, it was. Some of those stories have been told in Max Lambert's books Night After Night and Day After Day. And as he explained to me, his passion for writing war stories came from hearing about those adventures when he was a boy. When I was a little boy, I was nine when the war ended. And I had a cousin who was in the Air Force who was 15 years older than I was. He's still alive in, in Australia. Um, his name was Keith Thiel. And he came home from the war, from serving in the RNZ Air for four or five years overseas with a DSO and three DFCs. And he was the only New Zealander to get a DFC flying bombers and flying fighters. Um, he brought bombers back on two engines, all that sort of thing. And he featured in a book that came out just after the war called New Zealanders in the Air War. A little slim thing, but it was a bit of a profile about him and a lot of other guys that were quite prominent. And um, I had that, I knew it off by heart. Um, but then you, you go up and you go to, go to school and you, and you start working and you have a career and you get married and you have children. But it was just in 2000, I was in the Wellington Public Library one day and saw a book on Air War VCs. And it was an old, old book and I just leafed through it. And the story about a Scots air gunner, a, a wireless operator who got a VC um, on 1st of January 1945. Their plane was very badly hit by flak over the Dortmund Ems Canal. And both the gunner's turrets were enveloped in fire and, and had a big hole in the bottom of the aircraft. Um, and he got the gunners out and beat out the flames with his hands and was so badly burned, eventually he died. That uh, The pilot got the aircraft down into Allied lands, made a, Allied lines, made a great landing in Holland. They all got out of the plane, but one of the gunners died and the Scots, the man who'd done soaps, these heroics, he subsequently died in hospital four or five days later. Um, and he got the VC. The pilot was a young, a young New Zealander, a um, guy called Harry Denton. Um, and I thought it'd be fun to see if he, if he was still around. He was described as a Canterbury farmer. Um, and so he was relatively easy to find. I looked in the phone book and there's an H.C. Denton uh, in North Canterbury. So I phoned him and yes, it was him. And I talked to him on the phone. Um, nice long interview and wrote a newspaper feature and that was really what sparked night after night. I just thought to myself that, hey, his story had never been told. Um, he got the DFC for that, um, for getting that plane down. And his, his windscreen was blown out and everything, and he was no communication with the crew and the whole bit. Um, and, and it made a good story, and I thought there's a lot of other stories. What did it mean for these young people to go to Britain to fight? Oh, um, for a lot of them, they had, um, a lot of them came back, had nightmares after the war. A lot of them went through dreadful um, experiences, um, seeing um, their fellow air crew killed and, 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 and badly mutilated and, and that sort of thing. But I think the majority of them, as far as I can tell, and, and a lot of it's very personal, they don't often sort of give you their innermost feelings, but um, I have the impression that for many of them it was the best years of their lives. Uh, Des Scott, um, who wrote two books, he was a, you know, one of his own greats in, in the fighter pilot ranks, um, he said that everything after, after the war was sort of, he'd had his life then. I mean, he lived to a good age, but everything was anticlimactic after the, after the war. Do you think these young boys knew what they were letting themselves in for? No, they certainly didn't. I mean, I've, I remember the story of one young guy in the, in the bomber book that 
went past the uh, pit can as they used to do on the passenger ships and seeing the natives come out with all the stuff that they try to sell. And I won't do any of that, he said, in a letter home, I'll get it on the way back. And of course, he never no. came back. No. And, and I think that was, I mean, it was a great adventure. I mean, this was the end of the Depression. These guys, none of them had cars, hardly any of them had driven, um, no money, and he was an opportunity to go to the other side of the world, somebody would pay your airfare, and be a pilot, or a gunner, or radio operator, or whatever. And it was a great adventure, and they, and they, you know, they didn't have any idea, I don't think anybody had idea what, what Bomber Command's losses were going to be like during the war, what it was going to be like. Um, you know, they were still then flying ancient aircraft, um, had no idea what the defences were going to grow into or what the night fighter pilots were going to do to them. It was the Empire thing for them, we're going to do our bit. Well, the parents must have uh, been very apprehensive um, and they, I think they probably were later in the war once the casualty list started to appear. The conditions of the plane were, and the planes, particularly in the bombers, was, was really appalling. I mean, the you know, millimetre of of aluminium or whatever it was, quite the injure element. Um, no soundproofing, the, the roar of four engines, they were in that, in, that, um, in that aircraft for seven, eight hours, some of them longer, um, and that appalling noise and, and knowing that, you know, a night fighter would get you any moment or a flak would hit you, or that, you know, fire would break out, one of the engines would fail, catch fire, you'd be on your way down sort of thing. It was frightening, yeah. And you also tell the story of um, a young fighter pilot who's out there and he sees a German coming towards him and he knows he's got to take him out. You describe really quite heartbreakingly how this young pilot felt when he had to, to take this young, other young German out. He'd crippled the German plane and the pilot was trying to get out on the wing and looking at him. And, you know, it was a matter of, well, he's the enemy. Um, and then he gave him another burst and, and obviously killed the guy and felt badly for the rest of his life. Because there was a camaraderie in, in a way, even be between the, um, the Allied forces and, and the German pilots. The German pilots were doing their job. There was respect on both sides. Um, and there have been lots of stories of, of um, pilots on both sides who have, um, in the end, not given a fatal burst to somebody they could see was totally crippled, they had no way of getting home, um, but they didn't like to kill them. And there's an instance in there, though, on the other hand, of a, of a, of a young New Zealand pilot who deliberately fired into the cockpit of a German fighter which was on fire because he knew that the guy was going to burn to death and he tried to kill him. So there was chivalry. Yeah. How many of these men are still alive? Well, not many now. When I started research in 2000 on the, on the night after night, um, there, were, there were many around because each bomber had a crew of seven and you could normally find if you're looking for, there'd be you know, a couple of crew still alive either here or in the UK. Some people, some guys I talked to still had the majority of their crew of, alive, you know, there'd be a couple here, maybe three in UK, um, and they were all in their late 70s, early 80s. Now, 10 years later, while I'm working on the third book, um, they're all in the late 80s or early 90s, and so many of them have, 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 have died now. There's not that many around, but you occasionally find, I've found two pilots of Sterling bombers that towed gliders at Arnhem. They're both 92 and they're still alive. And they've got all their marbles. And I've had a wonderful talk with them, one in Christchurch, one in Havelock North. Um, so, you know, you keep trying to find these people. And, and, you know, most of them have never told their stories, nobody's ever asked them. And so it's rewarding to sort of find them and to get their story down. Um, and I think the story should be told. It's unbelievable what, what some of them did. I was talking there with author Max Lambert. 
After the break, we step back in history and meet up with pilot and aviation manager Jean DeMarco from the Vintage Aviator, who shows me around their rare collection of historic military aircraft at Masterton's Hood Aerodrome. That's next.